Welcome to this week's episode of Insight. During this week's show, we're going to cover two specific topics. Uh, the first one's going to be uh, the illegal uh, checkpoints, military checkpoints that have been established by the Aliyev regime at the start, at the beginning of the Lachin Corridor. And the second one are going to be the controversial statements that were made by the Prime Minister last week in his Q&A session in front of the Armenian Parliament. Let's start off with our first topic and uh, the most important one, which is the establishment of the illegal checkpoint by the Aliyev regime at the start of the Lachin Corridor. Sunday morning at around 11 a.m., uh, in an area that is in the zone of control of the Russian peacekeepers, in front of a Russian station or a military base, however you want to describe it, Aliyev's military forces moved in and started establishing a military checkpoint. The idea being that they control and they check everybody and everything that goes in and out of Artsakh. Uh, this was obviously clearly done with Russian approval because it could not have been done given the geographical location. The Russians have initially denied this, uh, and they've said contradictory things, but they've never criticized the regime in Baku for establishing this illegal checkpoint. They just said it should be removed, just as they always do. They always say that they never act against the regime. This checkpoint is not only a violation of the November 9th ceasefire agreement, it's actually a violation of international law, given the International Court of Justice ruling uh, demanding that this corridor should be left open without any such checkpoints. Now, what does this mean in practical terms? Uh, this is actually uh, the final step towards the official ethnic cleansing of Artsakh, of, of its historic Armenian population. Uh, in fact, what we're witnessing here is history. Uh, this is the second Armenian genocide in motion that has been essentially trumpeted to the world by the Aliyev regime, waiting to see how they would respond. Let's go over and understand what this means on the ground in practical terms. Uh, there's actually very little difference between having this uh, checkpoint and controlling what goes in and out of Artsakh, uh, or actually invading Artsakh entirely and taking control of it. Uh, because if you can control what goes in and who can come in and who can come out, you can actually ethnically cleanse Artsakh without ever invading it. For example, what, let's just look at this in practical terms. Uh, they can very easily allow residents of Artsakh to leave and not allow them to come back in. Um, they can, in fact, uh, start disappearing people that show up, claiming that they're illegally entering Azeri territory, kidnap them, murder them. All of this was done by the late, in the, eight, the late 80s and the 90s, the last time uh, the Azeri regime had any control over the lives of Armenians in Artsakh. They can obviously kill all commerce to essentially destroy Artsakh economically, which they've greatly done by this uh, blockade that's already happening in Shushi. Uh, they can control the food uh, and healthcare supplies going in and out. Essentially, this is an attempt to turn Artsakh into a version of Gaza. The only difference is that people in Gaza have no place to go, but in this case, their rationale and their logical thinking is that this will essentially lead to ethnic cleansing by people leaving Artsakh and moving to Armenia. Let's go and move towards the why now question. This is obviously a very clear Moscow-Baku program. This would be impossible to do without Russian approval. Now let's understand in clear terms what Baku wants. Uh, what they want is to kill the negotiations uh, and anything that moves towards a peace treaty and to accomplish ethnic cleansing followed up by no peace or recognized borders. The second thing that they want is actually to push the West out of this region uh, because Armenia's growing relationship with the West or having any relationship with the West is actually quite problematic for the regime in Baku. Now, what does Moscow want? Their first desire is actually to create political crisis in Armenia and destabilize and overthrow the current Armenian government. Uh, and Artsakh is the ultimate blackmail point for any Armenian government and the security of people living there is the ultimate blackmail. A second thing, which is a, a goal that they share with the Azeris, to actually push the West and the United States out of this region uh, and to kill any peace deal, uh, because any peace deal almost inevitably would mean them leaving the region. Now let's move on to what the reactions have been to this illegal move. Um, most interesting one, frankly, is from the government of Artsakh, who put out a statement, uh, essentially in very clear terms, calling out the Russian peacekeepers and the Russian state. Uh, they have always been exceptionally deferential because of the very precarious 
military and security situation that they're under. So their language was actually striking. Uh, the Armenian reaction has actually been quite strong also, calling it for what it is. It's a final step towards uh, ethnic cleansing. Um, the Western reaction, for the most part, uh, has been strong, but what it means, it, we don't know, because if it's not backed up by specific actions or threats, it really doesn't mean anything. Uh, in some ways, uh, this, uh, you know, this is a, a result of the, the no sanctions line that was put out constantly by especially the Americans. Uh, because at the end of the day, if the regime has nothing to fear, uh, it will act the way that it wants, uh, regardless of what anybody has to say around the world. Now let's speak in tactical terms, and again, uh, this is not to discount the horrendous humanitarian aspects of what's going on here. This is just to look at it in purely an an analytical viewpoint. Uh, this is actually uh, a tactical mistake by Ilham, uh, and we should make him pay for it. The, re the reason it's a mistake is because, frankly, he already controlled the road. Uh, his regime thugs had already blocked the road, so he actually had formal control of everything that goes in and out of Artsakh. Uh, but now he has actually taken formal responsibility for this blockade and the ethnic cleansing that it's intended to achieve. In truth, the gray area uh, ethnic cleansing uh, was far more profitable for the regime in Baku uh, for a simple reason, because the West, uh, no matter what they say, is actually okay with gray area uh, version of uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, because the black and white version, which he's actually moved to, is going to force them to be far more stronger in the words that they use, and hopefully, or what they really don't want, is to be forced to act to stop it. Well, what needs to be done is essentially four things. First one is to go back to the ICJ, which is the International Court of Justice, which the Armenian government said it's going to do. Uh, the second one is essentially to denounce the Russian blackmail and call them out on it uh, and openly demand international monitors, international peacekeepers. This is something that will press them politically. Uh, third is to suggest a compromise uh, of this checkpoint and this road being controlled by uh, EU or other credible partners. And again, it's not likely to happen, but it's something that creates political pressure. And lastly, make very clear that if continued negotiations and these kinds of actions go on, uh, Armenia is going to move on towards actually pushing for uh, and trying to gain political support for earned sovereignty for Artsakh, uh, something that given the genocidal nature and the intentions and the verbiage of the Aliyev regime is actually well within the bounds of international law. Let's move on to our second and final topic of the week, which is the uh, uh, controversies that came out of the Q&A session that the uh, Prime Minister had in front of the Parliament last week. There's actually three things that I want to focus on. Uh, one, that he said that, it is, uh, that he accepts the territorial integrity of, uh, of uh, Azerbaijan based on the Almaty Agreement, and that Azerbaijan should do the same to Armenia. Uh, secondly, that we will only have peace if we do so. And the third one in which talked about uh, that Armenia had already recognized the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan in the context of Artsakh being part of it in the Madrid principles from a more than a decade ago. So what is the problem here? Uh, the problem here is that he talked about recognizing uh, the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan without the immediate and the necessary proviso which we've always talked about, which is about the rights and securities of the Armenian residents of Artsakh guaranteed by the international community. He did not make that immediate connection, which is something that always needs to be done. Uh, secondly, uh, at no point in the last 30 years has the issue of Artsakh has ever been seen as solely an internal uh, issue of Azerbaijan. In fact, no country in the world outside of Azerbaijan claims that. And this is not something that we need to concede in a Q&A session in the parliament. Uh, and all of this coming in the context of what's going on in Artsakh is uh, tone deaf to say the least and totally unacceptable. The second thing he said is that we will not have peace unless we accept these agreements. Uh, and that's simply, I'm afraid, is not the case because we're not going to have peace no matter uh, what is signed, uh, because at the end of the day, the regime starts dying without an Armenian enemy. Third point was uh, his comments on the Madrid principles, in which he said that Armenia, more than a decade ago, agreed to Artsakh being a formal territorial part of Azerbaijan uh, in the Madrid principles, which is certainly actually not the case. Uh, 
What we're seeing here, and this is the actual key political point, is a growing contradiction between the language of the Prime Minister when it comes to talking about peace uh, and uh, public attitudes towards this. Uh, everyone in this country desires peace, uh, but almost no one actually believes it is possible given the nature of the regime in Baku and what their intentions are. In truth, this country is tired of what it seems to be a constant process of humiliation. And in response to it, it's actually militarizing on all levels. Some of, most of it actually outside of, uh, you know, state support or state control. People are organizing themselves, uh, training to defend their country. What people are looking for uh, in a political leader at this point, yes, and someone who could negotiate. But as importantly, if not more importantly, someone who will act as a commander in chief. Our foreign friends, you know, they praise the prime minister every time he speaks of peace and painful compromises and all of these things. Compromises that uh, essentially are never uh, answered to in any positive way from the regime in Baku, which just leads to more demands and more concessions and more war. Uh, what you're actually creating here is uh, the Armenian Gorbachev, someone who is actually quite popular in the West, but is losing credibility on a daily basis at home. Thank you for joining me in this episode of Insights. You lied to me all these years. You told me to wash and clean my ears and talk real fine, just like a lady. And you stop calling me Sister Sadie. Uh, but my country is full of lies. We all gonna die and die like lies. I don't trust nobody anymore. I keep on saying go slow.